and start. Um, okay, so hello DevOps Bootcamp. Um, this is the second session. Second session, uh, exclusively uh, taught online, uh, or at least this is the online version of the lesson. Uh, we learned that uh, recording sessions live does not always go as smoothly as we hope. So we hope that by doing it in a uh, more controlled environment, we'll actually get our content online for those of you who can't make it to Thursday nights at 6. There you go. So this week's lesson is about frameworks. So we're going to be talking about what a framework is, uh, what a web framework is specifically, and then we're going to talk about some examples of web frameworks. And then at the end, we're going to have some fun uh, code things to do. So let's get started. Uh, first, we should ask, what is a framework? So uh, last week, we talked about coding. And part of coding is using libraries, where we basically take someone else's code, functions that someone else wrote, um, and just sort of projects that someone else did. And we get to use their functions and their code in our projects. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Similarly, frameworks, uh, Wikipedia describes it as an an abstraction in which software providing generic functionality can be selectively changed by additional user written code, thus providing application specific software. That's very heady, uh, essentially. Um, I, I make it akin to like a vehicle or a boat, in this case, as the picture says. Um, whereas a, a library is sort of like a set of tools, like screwdrivers and hammers. Um, a framework is sort of like a very basic outline for a thing, and then you get to fill in the outline. So um, you could also think of it as like, Paint by uh, paint by number or something like that. Um, the different one one major difference between libraries and frameworks is that libraries tend to just give you functions and let you do what you want with them. Frameworks frameworks tend to sort of dictate a structure to your code. So they'll want you know certain library certain folders to exist. Um, they'll want certain you know they'll want functions to be organized in a certain way. Um, so, so that's one ma major difference. It's not just functions that you can use. It's actually um, a structure to your code, uh, including uh, helper functions like a library, but also just things that you need to do specifically to use that framework. So we'll do some examples, and this will make a little more sense. Um, so why would you use a framework? Uh, you could just use a library. But um, the biggest reason to use a framework is that you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time you do a project, a specifically a large project. So if you wanted to create a website like Facebook or Twitter or um, really anything, uh, anything large that you want a lot of people to use, you're not going to want to. Um, you're not going to want to write the software that interfaces with the uh, networking part of your computer, uh, and you're also not going to want to, you know, figure out URL routing and. Um, you're not going to want to write a template engine. Uh, what you really want to do is just let someone else invent that for you, uh, create the framework, and then you get to deal with high-level concepts, like when someone goes to this URL, what happens? So that's one major reason to use a framework over using uh, just a library or even just writing everything from scratch is that a lot of the base things that need to get done are already taken care of for you. And depending on the framework, more things are taken care of for you than others. Yeah, and uh, I know that one question I had when I was kind of going through this curriculum was, well, like, I don't really make huge websites very often. And that maybe is a question that you have as well. Um, but really, frameworks are used for anything that's bigger than like a very basic blog. So when we say big, we don't mean that it has to be a Facebook CL application. It can be um, like later in the uh, Oregon State curriculum, you'll take a web, app or a web design class website development, and you'll have to make a website for that. And that would be an ideal place to use a framework, because there's a lot of overhead for projects like that, where you need users and a database and uh, all this stuff that handwriting is just really a pain. Um, and a framework will take care of a lot of that stuff for you. So um, that's kind of the, the scope of website that we're looking at, is it doesn't have to be a behemoth like like Twitter or whatever. It can just be really anything that's bigger than like a static page. Yeah, so uh, speaking of static pages, well, let's talk about static versus dynamic websites. So uh, Wikipedia defines uh, the difference as being a static web page is a web page that is delivered to the user exactly as it is stored 
uh, in, con in contrast to a dynamic web page, which is generated by a web application. So examples of static sites include blogs, documentation, and even these slides. Fun fact, uh, inspect element is right there. Uh, these slides are actually just HTML in the browser. Um, and you can actually just inspect how it works on the HTML and CSS level. But uh, we just like to look at them because they're pretty. And you can view them in your own web browser. Uh, anyway, these were all generated with um, some other piece of software, but not necessarily a framework. Um, they were, let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> I just realized that's a rabbit hole I don't want to go down. But a dynamic website would be a web app like Facebook or Twitter or even just some small app you made for your friend's birthday um, or a search engine or pretty much anything with an account for sure. So uh, dynamic websites are websites that aren't uh, the same for everybody every time they see them. So uh, when you go to a blog, you're probably going to see the same thing over and over and over. But if you go to a dynamic website, uh, the, the page that you're looking at is going to change depending on whether you're logged in, whether you've been there before. Um, with search engines, uh, it, you're going to search and then it's going to give you a unique page of results. Um, Google doesn't just have every possible search result printed out in an HTML file and send it to you. And it's not just sent to you. It actually generates that on the fly in the back end and then, and then sends it to you. So Another way that I tend to think of it is that static pages are ones that you don't interact with. So it's something that you're just reading, or even this, you might say like, well, but I'm scrolling, and like that's an interaction. Um, but you're not typing anything in, whereas dynamic websites tend to be something where you give some piece of information to the website. So like Eli was using the example of your name, or if you have an account, using that, or the search engine, typing in a search. Um, anything where you're sending data to that website, that's probably a dynamic site. Uh, so some popular web frameworks. Um, there's a lot of frameworks for everything from game development to, um, I don't know, probably like just, I can only think of game development and web frameworks, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's more. And if you Google for web or just types of frameworks, you'll probably find them. Um, but uh, specifically for web frameworks, there's some really popular ones out there. There's a lot. The web is a pretty big place, and people like to make dynamic sites for it. So on the Java end, if you've ever programmed with Java, there's something called Swing. If you've ever programmed with PHP, there's something called Cake PHP. I don't personally have experience with these, but I've looked at them and they seem pretty popular. Uh, on the Python side, uh, I prefer Python, so I can talk about these pretty, pretty extensively. But we have Django, which is a very high-level framework. It has a lot of features. So when you build a website, it gives you like an admin interface. And it sort of makes assumptions like you will have accounts, you will have users, and things like that. And it, it's very conducive to that type of web application. Flask is much more lightweight. Um, you have to build everything yourself for the most part. So it gives you a lot of really nice features to get started. But anything beyond that, you have to build yourself. So it does not include admin interfaces, but it does include, we'll get into this later, uh, templating engines and URL routing. Uh, so on the Ruby side, uh, Ruby is a very popular language. Uh, you have Rails, which is sort of uh, analog to Django. It's very uh, heavy, got a lot of, it has a lot of features that are very useful. And then, and then uh, analog to Flask is Sinatra, which is very stripped out, um, very basic, but uh, it takes care of a lot of features for you. Uh, so it would be a pain in the butt to write. Uh, on the Node.js side, if you're a JavaScript person, we have Express, Koa, and Happy. Uh, these are all pretty different. Uh, Happy looks the most different from the rest that we've seen. It doesn't really treat web pages as code. It sort of treats them as something different. Um, but if you would like to learn more about these, I really can't speak to most of them. I encourage you to look at them. If you go to these slides, each of the names is a link to um, the website for that project. So yeah. Uh, did we skip one? Oh, yeah. sorry. OK, so, um, so URL routing is one of the first main features that a, a web framework will give you. Um, and uh, URL routing is essentially, uh, think of this, this story. So when you go to the website, github.com slash DevOps Bootcamp, uh, what happens just in general? So your, your computer sends a request to github.com, and it says, I want to go to github.com slash DevOps Bootcamp. And then GitHub says, OK, well, I don't have like a static HTML file for that. But what I do have uh, is this um, web framework that, or this, this application built on a web framework that can probably generate that page for you. 
so that it takes DevOps Bootcamp and it looks up and it says, okay, well, I have this information on DevOps Bootcamp. Here's what the website should look like. Or here's what the page should look like. And then it sends it off. Or if it doesn't find DevOps Bootcamp, it'll probably send you a 404 page. Um, so in Flask, this is very easy. Essentially, you say at app.route uh, and then the, um, uh, the endpoint that you want to reach. So if it has um, angle brackets around it, that means it's a variable. And then within this function, you can treat this as a variable. Um, so say you wanted to go to slash uh, my face, and then in your function, you can specify you know, my face as like a variable that gets sent to a template or something. So yeah, to, to relate this to the GitHub example, uh, if GitHub were theoretically built on Flask, it would say at app.route and then slash DevOps bootcamp, and then it would have some function that would tell GitHub how to render the DevOps bootcamp page, if that makes sense. Yeah, so in the function. So, so yeah, so this last part of the URL is what would go in this little, uh, like Eli said, it was an endpoint. Uh, and then the def render function, that function will tell the application how to render that page. Sure. So in this section, the, the do stuff section, there's a lot more code here, but it might say something like take the name, look it up in a, look it up in the database, return all the information we have on that organization, uh, take this uh, other information, plug it in here. Um, do certain lookups, and then at the end, return the web page that, that you eventually see, which is just HTML. Um, uh, another thing we'll get, uh, we're, we're getting to is something called templates. So who likes Mad Libs? <laughs> so, uh, this is much quieter it's without funny. an audience. Yeah, it's funny because there's like no one in this room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, uh, basically a Mad Lib, for those that have not done a Mad Lib, is uh, basically it's, it's a, a whole paragraph or a sentence with blank, uh, with blanks in place of words, and then it asks for a type of word. And usually, people give up really funny words like an exclamation, an adverb, a noun, and an adjective. And then at the end, you read it out, and it's super funny and kind of makes sense. So a templating engine is sort of similar in that um, it uh, is an HTML web page, or not necessarily HTML, but commonly HTML web page. Uh, that is uh, template out. So basically, people can uh, take the template, um, give it certain variables, and then in the template it says, "Put this variable here as this string" or something like that. So um, uh, one one common example is think about how Facebook might put your name on the uh, Facebook uh, page that you see. So um, uh, if you, if you look at the, the Facebook page that you see for your profile, uh, they all kind of look the same. They all have the same picture up top. Uh, they all have you know your, your profile picture, your name, and then your posts. So uh, the way that Facebook does this usually is when you go to your profile page, it looks up you, and then it looks up all your information, like which profile picture you have, which background picture you have, your interests. And then it just takes the Facebook profile template and sticks all of your information in the appropriate places. So it can use one web page and uh, do some, some code on the back end to basically generate what your page should look like for everyone. Um, so this is much more efficient than generating everyone's web page and then changing that every time someone changes their page. Um, so uh, here are some examples of templating engines and what they look like in action. Um, uh, this is an example of Jinja, which is very popular on the Python side of things. Uh, you can pass it. Um, it can also do uh, logic in addition to doing uh, just inserting. Um, excuse me. In addition to just inserting variables, it can also do logic. So it can do for loops, like we talked. About. It can also do if statements. Um, so uh, for this, uh, we have um, navigation, which is a, an array of items. And then for every item, we want to create a link, or we want to add a list item. And in the list item, we're going to have a, a caption that's going to be that's going to link to item.href. And then we do that for every item in the for loop, and then we finish. So um, I guess I have two things. One is that don't worry too much about the word engine in this. Uh, like I would just think of a templating engine as just being like the thing that gives you templates, uh, and like engine is just included for some reason. 
Um, and another thing is that uh, with these like item.href or item.caption, um, we don't want to get too far into data structures right now. But basically what that's saying is that the item object has two attributes, one of which is called href and one of which is called caption. So um, basically uh, the item, like you can almost think of it as being like a person and that's its way of saying like, I know that this item has brown hair and blue eyes and is five feet tall. Um, and that's all information that you specify when you create the item. So uh, we'll probably get into that a little bit further down the line in DevOps Bootcamp, but just know that the item that I draft isn't coming from a magical place. It is defined somewhere else um, as, like I said, it's something called an attribute of that object. So Right, so before this happened, there was navigation, which is a list, and navigation was populated with a bunch of items, and each item has two attributes href and caption, and those are both user specified. They're not special to Python or the templating engine. These, this could be item.link and item.text, and it could be effectively the same thing. Yeah. Uh, another templating engine is, uh, this is Liquid, which is used by Jekyll. It's very similar to Jinja uh, with a few uh, differences, a few quirks. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you're welcome to. Uh, it's used pop. It's popular in Jekyll, uh, which is the uh, static site generator behind GitHub Pages. If you've ever used that. Uh, oh, this almost goes off the end of the page. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, that didn't accomplish anything. Um, so a few other examples are eRuby, which is embedded in Ruby, and this is sort of similar to the previous ones, um, but uh, it's. Uh, my understanding is that it's a little more extendable in that you can just embed straight Ruby into your template, um, whereas the other two, I think, are a little more limited. They have, they have special features that are implemented, but this is just Ruby within a template. Um, and then this is Jade, which is interesting in that it doesn't actually use any HTML. Uh, it just uses its own markup language and then converts that into HTML. And this is sort of what that would look like. Um, e each of these would produce the same output, which is this HTML at the bottom. Uh, yeah, so assuming uh, user.firstName is Dave, uh, that's what this is. Yeah. Uh, so now we're going to move on to our activity. Uh, first, uh, log into your Linux virtual machine. So if you're in, if, if you're able to be in class, you can just, we, we provide you with one. If you're not able to, uh, we have some uh, links on our website, devopsbootcamp.osuosl.org. Uh, to get set up with your own virtual machine. Um, now we're going to go to, uh, uh, I, have, I have a log, I'm already logged into one right here uh, as the user manatee. Um, you're, we're going to go to github.com uh, slash devops bootcamp slash tiny flask app. And if we go there, we can see there's a little tiny flask application. And uh, it has a set of instructions, but we can just follow along here. Uh, uh, so you're going to go to that application, and then uh, you're going to clone the repository, and then you're going to follow the directions in the README, and then um, uh, and then once we're we're all set up, we're going to uh, run the application to see what what happens. Uh, and then if that's not enough for you, you can actually make your own Flask application at flask.poco.org, uh, and then just follow this link essentially. It takes literally like five minutes. It's pretty quick. Uh, it might take a few times. It took me a few times to get really to get a good grasp on what Flask does. But once you get there, you're you're good. So um, let's go over to this. So I've already cloned the Tiny Flask app. So we're going to cd into Tiny Teensy Flask app, and then if we look in here, uh, we're going to uh, open the README. And essentially what it does is it tells us to clone the application, cd into the tiny Flask app, or Teensy Flask app, and then we're going to create a Python virtual end. Uh, once we've created the virtual end, we're going to source it, which basically means we're in the Python sandbox. And then we're going to install the requirements. I'm just reading off what goes on here. And then we're going to run script.py. Uh, and then it's going to tell you that it's running on 127.0.0.1.8080. 
but um, because of the configuration we have, it's not going to be running on 8080 for you. It'll be running on 80 uh, something else. So it might be 8081, 8092. Um, uh, if we gave you a virtual machine, if you're running locally, it will actually be on 8080. So let's go back uh, to this. Uh, So I just had to delete my virtual end just so we can see the whole process. So virtual end, vn, and then source vn bin activate. And now you can see, uh, because we have vn pre-pending our uh, prompt, it means that we are in the virtual environment. So now we can just freely install whatever we want. And now we're going to pip, uh, well, we're going to we're going to open the requirements file. And this is all the Python requirements that we need. So we need Flask, It's Dangerous, Jinja2, Markup Safe, WorkZug, and Wheel. Uh, and basically, these are just what you need to run any Flask application. So if you install Flask, it actually installs all of these for you as well. So pip install dash r requirements.txt. And the dash r just means uh, open a file and install from the file. So there we go. That was pretty quick. Um, and now, if we just run uh, python script.py, it'll tell us that it's running on 000 8080. Uh, but I know that mine is actually running at uh, 8081. Um, and sorry, this is a little confusing uh, because we have to work with uh, the, the, the system that we created, um, which is super nice on the back end, but maybe not as intuitive on the front end. But we have to go to bootcamp dot osu osl dot org colon eighty eighty one for me and if we go there I can see a little website I made uh, where it prints out the current time and a little application and then if I go to slash user slash uh, Dave for instance just any name it tells me I'm sorry Dave but I can't do that for you and then I have a little broken image but we're working on that um, so let's look at the code that's that's powering this. So if we open, uh, let's open it in Vim. If we open uh, this application, we can see uh, first we import uh, Flask, and then we also import date time. Uh, actually, we don't import Flask. We import Flask, send file, URL for, and render template. And these are just Flask Flask specific. Whoa, <laughs> Flask specific things. Man, that was hard. Um, and if you look at the uh, getting started guide on Fla on the Flask website, you'll you'll find all of these. And then we create our application, which is just an instance of the Flask object. And we'll talk about objects later in a later lesson. And then for fun, I created this dogs uh, array, and you'll actually use that when you implement your own feature. Uh, spoiler alert: uh, This is uh, that URL routing we were talking about. So when you hit the slash endpoint, which is just the home page, uh, it's going to call the index function. Uh, effectively, it's going to call the index function. Um, and then uh, it's going to say, uh, it's going to create the URL for uh, x.gif. And then I think that might be what's broken. Anyway, um, it's going to establish what now is, like what the time right now is. And then it's going to return, it's going to render a template. Uh, it's going to render the index.html template. And it's going to pass it. Uh, it's going to render the index.html template, and then it's going to pass it the variable time, uh, or it's going to pass it the variable now as the variable time. And we'll, we'll open a template soon and, and see what that looks like. Uh, and the other endpoint I have is slash user slash username. Uh, so this uh, renders a specific page slash user, and then um, it takes the variable username, and then I can modify, I can do whatever I want with that. So, for instance. Uh, I create the URL for hal.png, which is just the, the image. Uh, I don't think you actually need to do this. It's just good to be explicit that I'm using hal.png. Uh, and then I render the template uh, user.html, which is just a Jinja template. And then I pass it the variable username as username. And we will open a template and try that in a second. And then at the bottom, I have, uh, I run, if I'm running the script, I run my application. Uh, on port 8080, and then I also set debug to true. And debug is really nice because I can basically uh, I can go to like slash users uh, uh, slash stf. Basically, if I break things, in theory it works. Uh, oh, sorry, the script is not running. So 
So the URL was not found. That's actually a pretty good error. Uh, Okay, well, in theory, this should just print out a nice uh, stack trace. So if something broke on the back end, it would actually print on the front end on the website uh, what broke. So that's really nice for debugging purposes. Um, but now we're going to open a template. Uh, and all the templates are stored in the templates directory. And we're going to open index.html. Uh, and we're going to open user. Or actually, we're going to, yeah. User.html. So index.html. Um, uh, so at the top, index.html says that it extends base.html. And this basically means that it takes a previous template and adds to it. Uh, and then it says block body. And then within the block body, it has some HTML code. And then we see our time variable is being used. This is really nice because uh, we can extend templates. So Say we always have a header and a footer that look the same, but the middle of our website, the main content, is, is different depending on the, the page. We can just extend a base template, uh, and then it says where our block body is, block body and block. Uh, it replaces that block content with this content. So if you can see the block body is the same, uh, it basically just cuts this out, uh, pastes this in, and then does the whole templating thing. So it replaces the time variable with whatever we pass as time. Uh, and then same with user. Uh, I pass username to this template. And then it replaces, I'm sorry, username, but you can't, I can't do that for you. And then it should um, put in this, this image. Uh, so yeah, um, that's basically uh, templates and um, URL routing. And uh, what you should do is open up script.py, go to the bottom, and then it says uh, uh, to do, you should add another endpoint called slash dog. And then when you go to slash dog slash some other, some type of dog, it returns um, uh, either that dog, or if you just go to the slash dog endpoint, it just returns a random dog from the list. So that can be kind of fun. You can have a little fun with it, maybe include images. Uh, yeah, so oh, that's it. And uh, thanks. You good? Yeah. Cool. Uh, if you guys have questions, you can always email us at devopsbootcamp at osuosl.org. We're also on IRC at pound DevOps Bootcamp on Freenum. And our website is devopsbootcamp.osuosl.org. So. Um, hey, it's been alive, say. So, yeah. Me too. Cool. Go team. We just high fived. We just high fived in, in real life.